The hour of 10.30 having arrived, I'm going to call the Higher Education Finance and Policy uh, Committee to order. Members are going to make a brief adjustment on the agenda. Representative Wolgamont is going to present House File 3985. The committee is in possession of the bill. We need no motion on this bill. He will present the bill, and then we will simply hold it in the committee. Representative Wolgamont, uh, welcome to the committee. Uh, please identify yourself and present your bill. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. It is great to be here before the House Higher Education Committee to present House File 3985, which is a bill to provide clarification on the appropriation language from Chapter 41, as requested by the University of Minnesota Medical School and the CentraCare Health Leadership Team. Mr. Chair and members, I'm bringing this bill forward the current, because the current legislative language states that the programmatic support dollars are available through fiscal year 2027, and this bill clarifies the use of these funds to be utilized to support the program, program, programmatic startup of the Central Care St. Cloud Regional Medical School campus, residency program, and the Research Institute. That's the bill, Mr. Chair, it's a simple clarification, and we're more than happy to take any questions that you or any other members of the committee may have. Representative Rarick. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So while it is a clarification, I'll give you that, there is a substantive change, and I would like to talk about that and ask you the, the reasoning behind it. So we're going from straight scholarship to an endowment, and um, since we do have um, a date, June 30th of 2027, that the funds must be used by. Um, when we're doing something like that, that typically cancels back uh, to the general fund any funds that are not expended. Um, so I'm wondering if you could let us know the reasoning behind going from a scholarship program to an endowment fund. Representative Wilgamont. Thank you for the, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for the question, Representative Rarick. Uh, Mr. Chair, there are some folks from the University of Minnesota here who can provide further detail to Representative Rarick's question. Welcome to the committee, um, and please identify yourself for the record. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm actually not from the university. My name is Jody Gerken, and I'm actually with CentraCare. Um, and um, Chair Pulowski, thank you, um, Representative, for bringing up the question. When we came here last year, um, we had actually asked for a significant um, more than what we were graciously given. So it made us change some of our priorities. So therefore, um, we wanted to look at how we could utilize the 10 million we received um, rather than the 72 million that we were originally asking for. And so our um, finance team worked with the University of Minnesota to create these changes. Does that answer your question? Representative Rare. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. No, the question is, it went from a scholarship program, which can cancel back to the general fund, sure. to an endowment program, which does not. And I'm wondering why that pro that uh, policy change was is, is in here. Ms. Gerken. I would have to go back to our CFO, um, who isn't with us today, unfortunately, and get that clarification. I don't want to misspeak. Representative Rare. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so this is a, a pretty substantial change, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, obviously, a scholarship fund versus an endowment fund are very different. They operate very, very differently. And uh, typically, when we're doing a general fund appropriation, as you know, Mr. Chair, that any unspent funds after that expiration date or the uh, available on date would cancel back to the general fund when it's in an endowment. It's my understanding that that does not. I was trying to get clarification on that. I don't know if we've got uh, nonpartisan fiscal staff that could speak to the difference between the scholarship fund and an endowment fund. Uh, Representative Rarick, I think we do. Uh, Chair and members for the record, Ken Savory, nonpartisan House Fiscal. Um, in looking at the proposed language, there is no function within this, within this language that takes the money and puts it into a separate account. For example, there is no transfer to a special revenue fund account. As to your point, Representative Rarick, these are general fund dollars. And the expiration on 3.12, I don't believe there's anything within this bill that would supersede that. So um, under my understanding, this, these dollars would expire on the date prescribed in the, uh, in the House file. Representative Rare. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so then my question remains, why are we changing this from a scholarship program to an endowment fund? What, why is that needed? Uh, Representative Brarick, that's why we're hearing the bill today, and the bill will stay in possession of the committee. We're taking no action on it, and uh, when we bring the bill back, uh, assuming we will bring the bill back, 
hopefully we'll have clarification. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I would not be comfortable um, voting for this. I know we're not voting, but when it comes to that voting for this change until we get that clarification, because uh, my understanding of what an endowment is, is is slightly different, and maybe I have a misunderstanding, but I would like to know um, the functionality of that and just to make sure that it actually does what it says it's supposed to do. The other question I would have, too, is since it's 10 million, not 72 million, and there isn't uh, there isn't any specificity as to what's going into the scholarship endowment fund, what's going, what's going to be used for the other <clears throat> programs, um, and I'm wondering if they could give us that, at, at least that, to kind of get a sense as to where they would put this $10 million, Mr. Chair. Ms. Gerken? I would be happy to. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Representative. So, Representative Burke, I think we will have that information for you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I was really hoping that we would hear that today as we're hearing the bill today. Uh, uh, I do know that there's some Representative folks from Rarick, this is a preliminary hearing. Uh, when we bring the bill back, um, if we bring the bill back, uh, we will hopefully have all of those answers. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for that commitment that uh, we'll have better answers when we revisit this. So I just want to make it clear what I'm asking, right? So um, yes. Representative Wolgamon and, and your team I would like to really know why this is being changed to the endowment fund um, and what are going to what are the estimated appropriations from that 10 million to each of those categories. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Rarick, so noted. Representative Wolgamont, any final comment? Uh, Mr. Chair and members, thank you for the time today to present House File 3985. We look forward to answering any further questions. Representative Robbins has one more. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Sorry. Um, Thank you for bringing this bill, Representative Wolgamont. And I do have a question. I'm just trying to understand, maybe this is more for Mr. Chair than for Representative Wolgamont, but the U has now three medical campuses. And my concern, as I've raised in previous hearings, is how like, the broader picture is working. We're about to start this third campus when we're already looking at significant investment at the University of Minnesota campus. We just did significant investment at the medical school up in Duluth. I, I would love to have um, some sense from perhaps someone from the University of Minnesota who's here about how all of these align, how they fit together. Why do we need three medical campuses, <laughs> medical schools in our state of six million people? This is a huge investment that we are just starting. And as we saw with the University of Medical, um, the Twin Cities campus and the Fairview partnership, that has not been financially successful, shall we say. And before we get too far down this road with another medical school partnership, <coughs> I think we need to understand the data and the numbers a little bit better than I feel I'm prepared to. And so hopefully that could be at a future hearing, Mr. Chair, but I just, I just think we need to have our eyes wide open about what we are committing ourselves to if we go down this path. Representative Robbins, I would hope that members would um, also meet with uh, the university and St. Cloud uh, over the next uh, few weeks in order to get those questions answered. Uh, the scope of this bill, this bill has already been passed. Uh, we're just dealing with a, uh, hopefully, Representative Wolgamont, minor uh, adjustment. So Representative Wolgamont, if you have a brief answer to that question, uh, Representative Wolgamont. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Robbins. I just want to reiterate what the chair is saying, that we're not appropriating any new dollars here. We're just clarifying the use of dollars that were already appropriated. It's to the larger question of why we could get in to all kinds of details and data about how, how Greater Minnesota is facing a healthcare workforce shortage and the numbers between um, people who practice healthcare in rural Minnesota do not match up with the people who need healthcare in rural Minnesota. And we know that people who go to, go to medical school in rural areas are three times more likely to stick around and practice in rural areas. So we're bringing this forward so we can tackle the healthcare workforce shortage in rural Minnesota and make sure that people who live in rural Minnesota have access to the healthcare providers that they need. Representative Thank Robbins. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Hicks, to the bill. So, uh, Rochesterite, 
So thank you, Chair, for indulging me. But as a reminder, the largest private employer in the state of Minnesota is a healthcare system that has just recently announced the largest private investment by any business in, in the state of Minnesota, $5 billion. So anytime we can help make sure we have healthcare providers, um, we're funneling into our largest enterprise in the state of Minnesota. So I just scratched a person wanting to remind everybody that healthcare is our largest business in the state of Minnesota. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Representative Wolgamont. Thank you, uh, Ms. Gerken. And uh, we'll move now to uh, Min State, and they'll continue their presentation on the capital investment. <laughs> Members, you should have saved, I hope, in your packet the material that they uh, brought at the last meeting. And with that, uh, welcome to the committee, and please identify yourself for the record. Indeed, good morning, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chair and Committee. I'm Brian Yolitz, and I serve as the Associate Vice Chancellor for Facilities for the Minnesota State College and University System. The Chancellor Olson is unable to return to today's hearing, but sends his regards and has full appreciation for all the time you, uh, that you and the support you have provided to Minnesota State and the students we serve through the last legislative session and now into 2024 as well as for the time you and your colleagues have taken getting to know our colleges and universities and their challenges and priorities, especially in the area of capital investment in our existing academic buildings. Your colleagues from the House Capital Investment Committee, uh, some of you who are on this committee as well, uh, along with their counterparts from the Senate, along with staff from MMB and the governor's office, made more than 40 campus visits uh, over the last six months uh, during their bonding tours around the state, and they have been very busy what they saw in person uh, was a broad sampling of Minnesota State's capital investment priorities uh, for this legislative session. During this bonding session, Minnesota State seeks a capital investment, capital investment funding for a $541.4 million program to preserve, protect, and improve existing college and university facilities to better serve and educate Minnesotans and the workforce. 200 million of the request is for asset preservation through HEPR, to fund more than 70 projects at college and university campuses across the state. In addition, 341.4 million is for design and or construction of 15 specific college and university projects. These include construction of five projects. The state has invested over 17 million in design and preparatory work last session, full design and construction of eight campus projects, and then design of two campus projects that would seek construction funding in a future legislative session. All of these projects have completed their pre-design work and are ready to move forward this session. Given our one-third de shared debt responsibility on individual college and university projects, this program seeks state funding of $427.6 million and then user financing of $113.8 million uh, for a portion of the 15 uh, major capital projects in the request. This user financing is funded by Minnesota State College and Universities uh, on an individual basis. This program request and priorities are, is a result of a disciplined process that begins with ongoing campus facilities planning, which is formally documented on a five-year cycle in, in what we call Individual Comprehensive Facilities Plans, or CFPs. In preparation for this legislative session, our Board of Trustees adopted guidelines for developing their request of the legislature and the governor and the priorities for the, in April of 2022. These guide, guidelines embraced four major themes, focusing on modernizing academic and student spaces, uh, facilitating the vision of Equity 2030, and advancing resiliency and environmental sustainability, and then also the standard of no net increase in our academic footprint. Institutions then reviewed their CFPs, those plans from their campuses, and developed pre-designs for their priority candidate projects uh, that were submitted to the system office. These candidate projects were then reviewed and scored by representatives from across the system uh, against the board guidelines. The results were prioritized and offered to the chancellor uh, and then to our board of trustees for a review and then final approval uh, and, along with the priorities in June of 2023. This program was uploaded to the state's, uh, state of Minnesota's capital and budget system, and I know it creates some rather reams of documents, and that's why we find our bonding book that we'll re return to here in a moment so helpful. 
As I mentioned, your colleagues from the House and Senate, the Capital Investment Committees, MMB, and the Governor's Office have been very busy on bonding tours uh, across the state in the last six months. As I mentioned, we found the bonding book to be a very practical and easy reference uh, to understand our capital request. I believe everybody has a copy, maybe not as beat up as mine, but uh, certainly for a reference uh, of our request. We understand staff and committee uh, also have a link should they want further reference in the future. I'll be referencing some of the pages as we walk through our program review with you. You'll see on page seven of the bonding book, uh, after some introductory information orienting our readers to Minnesota State and the students we serve, is our full program request in priority order. The number one priority is for 200 million for asset preservation through HEPR funding. This, fund, this funds asset preservation projects including roof replacements and mechanical and utility system upgrades at Minnesota State College Universities, saving energy, making campuses safer, and reducing operating expenses. Keep your funding for asset preservation of existing academic buildings continues to be an urgent and pressing need. A story you, can be, have, you may have heard on your campus visits and on other testimony uh, before this committee and one that was underscored at each of the campus visits during the fall bonding tours. More details on asset preservation and the campus impacts are available on pages eight and eight through 11 of the bonding book. Looking at HEPR funding history, we see that the last six bonding years, 2012, 14, 16, 18, 20, and 22, Minnesota State has requested as their number one priority a total of 760 million for asset preservation work through HEPR. These requests were to address the most urgent college university needs in campus building exterior repairs, including roofs, windows and door and exterior brickwork, heating and cooling system upgrades, and upgrades to utility and energy management systems. In all the bonding bills during that period between 2012 and 2023, Minnesota State has received 223.5 million in HEPR funding or less than 30% of the requested amount needed to address the most urgent preservation needs of our college and university campus buildings. This level of HEPR funding has led to an, a, a major, majority of preservation needs going unmet. And as a result, we've seen the backlog of maintenance of in our academic buildings, meaning the estimated cost of those building components and systems that have exceeded their useful lives uh, and are now outdated and obsolete grow. Since 2013, we've seen an estimated backlog more than double to over 1.5 billion. In addition, as we look over the coming 10 years out to 2033, we see an estimated 1.4 billion in building systems and components reaching or exceeding their useful lives. This tells us we have a roughly a $2.9 billion 10 year renewal need to address those building, building systems and items already in backlog and take care of those items that are, uh, that will age out in the years ahead. As a quick note, uh, there was $82 million or about 40% of our request for HEPR was included in the governor's 2024 capital budget recommendation released in early January or late January. This slide shows where we would apply those funds should they be made available today. This addresses about 23 campus projects uh, for our colleges and universities. To set that in context, Mr. Chair and Committee, here is how asset preservation or uh, HEPR priorities by college and universities share in a set of project lists that I provided in the, uh, the blue handout, and I'll reference that as we go through. First, on the, on the, is in the green column on the far left is our request for 200 million for this session. It funds about 71 projects at our college and universities. Listed on pages one, two, and three by institution and in their priority order as established by the campus leadership. The governor's recommendation of 82 million would fund 23 projects, and that's listed on, the, on page nine, the last page of the, of the packet. Um, it would take $109 million to fund the number one priority at each of our 33 colleges and universities. Those are listed on page four and five. And finally, on pages six, and, six to eight, 174 million would fund the priorities number one and two from our institutions that submitted those uh, in our process or in late last year. Each and every one of our college and university campuses has multiple buildings and components and systems that have exceeded their useful life 
and need updating and replacement now. Moving to our individual project priorities uh, for working for work renovating and replacing existing academic buildings uh, starts with priorities <laughs> two through five. Please turn through uh, to page 12 to 13 where you find major capital project overviews beginning on the far left with our priority number two, the academic excellence renovation for St. Paul College. It was the only project that was included in the governor's recommendation in January. This project, along with the following three, the MSU Mankato Armstrong Hall replacement, Winona State University Center for Interdisciplinary Collaboration, Engagement, Learning, or CECL project, <coughs> Alexandria Technical and Community College's Transportation Center and Campus Center, and then jumping down to priority nine, the Rochester Community and Technical College Heinz Center renovation on page 15 of the bonding book. They all received design funds in 2023, totaling 17.3 million. For, and for design and preparatory work and will be ready for construction funding this session. Working down the priority list, priority six, the Riverland Community College Student Services renovation through priority eight, the St. Cloud State University Education Learning Building replacement, as well as priority 10, the Minnesota West Community and Technical College Nursing and Student Services renovation, and priority 11, the Ridgewater Healthcare construction and student services and classroom renovation were all part of our request in 2022 and 23, but were ultimately not funded. These project overviews are found on pages 14 through 16. And then finally, in terms of program priorities, priorities 12 through 16, beginning with the request to renovate and modernize the instructional spaces at the Winona campus of Minnesota State College Southeast through the request for the library renovations at Normandale Community College. These are all new funding requests this legislative session. Pre-designs are complete on each of these projects. The request for the Dakota County Technical College is for design this session and will seek construction funding in the future. Projects at MSC Southeast, South Central College and Oka Ramsey Community College and Normandale Community College would fund the full design and renovation work at each of those campus project requests. More t details on those individual projects are included on page 17 through 19 of your bonding book. Mr. Chair and committee, we recognize that competition for state funding is keen and state resources are limited, but investment in higher education is critical to the success of our students and to all of Minnesota the, with impacts running deep into the future. We have seen a general and steady decline in capital investment in higher education, whether it's investment in Minnesota state by itself, that's the green line trending, or the total capital investment in the public higher education system is both Minnesota State and the University of Minnesota. This de decline is concerning as many of our facilities and our systems have reached the end of their useful lives. And recall we have a total of a $2.9 billion preservation need before we modernize and upgrade aging classrooms and labs and individ through individual major capital projects so we can be competitive with our uh, neighboring states in the region. We are eager to continue to work to slow and reverse this trend, this session, and into the future. Mr. Chair and Committee, before closing, I do want to tell you what funding from 23 has been put, has been put to use and is already making a difference. With 22, with 20 HEPA projects well underway, some are even nearing completion, making our campuses warm, safe, and dry. In addition, 20, the 2023 bill included uh, 13 individual campus projects that are noted in the green uh, stars. Construction is underway at MSU, or MSU Moorheads uh, and Inver Hills Community College and Minneapolis College acting on designs funded in prior bonding bills. Pine Technical and Community College will soon wrap up its design process and move on to construction of its major project as well. And then design is well underway for the Vermilion campus of Minnesota North College the Brainerd campus of Central Lakes College and the East Grand Forks campus of Northland Community and Technical College, Lake Superior College in Duluth, and then finally at Metropolitan State University. And as we've highlighted earlier, designs for projects at St. Paul College, MSU Mankato, Winona State University, Alexandria Technical and Community College and Rochester Community and Technical College are well underway and will be ready for construction funding this session. And then finally, Chair Pulowski and committee, I personally wanna thank you and this committee for your time and attention. Late last uh, meeting, 
to take some time to listen to Mr. Spleth and Mr. Blackwell who shared what keeps them up at night as they do their work uh, running our campuses. Jim and Josh represent the facility staffs that I get to work with day in and day out at our 52 campuses around the state and share the common goal of being good stewards and creating and maintaining campus buildings that are warm, safe and dry for our students to come to learn and our faculty to teach and mentor and not make the front page news, Mr. Chair. Hmm. Representative Wogelman. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for uh, the presentation, Mr. Vice Chancellor. Mr. Chair, before I get to my question, I just want to share how really we are sort of, we're doing a dereliction of duty here as a state. When I look at the chart on page eight, HEPR requests funded only 29%. When I look at the graph on page nine, deferred maintenance has grown by 116%. And then I look at this chart on page 16 that the percent of total state capital investment is only 6%. For Minnesota State, we are really not living up to our commitment to these systems to take care of these facilities that they have and are entrusted with which to, to educate and empower our workforce. So I just wanted to bring that to the committees and the public's attention. And my question, Mr. Vice Chancellor, is can you explain, you know, it's one thing to look at numbers on a chart or numbers on the paper, but can you please explain to us in further light the impact that this, this declining investment in HEPR and <coughs> asset preservation has had on the colleges and universities throughout the system on their ability to live up to their missions to educate students. Mm -hmm. But does it have an effect on enrollment? Does it have an effect on the students that we attract to our campuses? Does it have an effect on the work being done to prepare them to enter into the workforce? Again, take these numbers on the charts and can you please just explain what, what that really means for Minn State's ability to fulfill its mission? Vice Chancellor. Mr. Chair and Representative Wagamont, indeed our facilities, uh, the lack of investment has continued to increase the operating expenses for our college, for our uh, campuses through energy costs and uh, recurring and ongoing maintenance and the troublesome uh, trying to find parts and pieces for systems that have exceeded our useful life. And indeed, I would argue, I'm a facilities guy, but I, I still would argue that the way our facilities look and operate are set the first impression. And uh, if they don't represent a professional and um, uh, cleaner and inviting environment, there is an impact on enrollment. I know we've had some anecdotal stories, some of my staff included, when they've had uh, their kids visit our campuses and they say, well, this is like going back in time uh, when we look at um, uh, what I've got in my high school today, whether it's their uh, classrooms and labs, science labs, or if it's their, uh, their athletic facilities. So all of those play a role and I think um, we've, our college universities have to represent that door to the future and to a better life for our for Minnesotans. And I think uh, investment in these facilities is critical to our to state success. Representative Wilgerman. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for that, uh, that explanation, Mr. Vice Chancellor. And I just want to add that in light of seeing these charts and in light of what you just shared, the impact that that has on enrollment, on attracting students, on preparing them for the workforce. I really do hope that we take advantage of the opportunity before us uh, that was just outli outlined by last week's uh, budget forecast. I really can't think of a better bang for a one-time buck than a large bonding bill that helps us get out of this heaper hole that we've built ourselves into and helps the facilities at the colleges and universities throughout the Minnesota state system get up to speed so that we are in a position to attract the best and, by, best and brightest students to our campuses and that we are in a good position to prepare the workforce for the future. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chancellor, and thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Davids. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, and to the witness, I wonder, uh, do you have any type of plan B or plan two because you're not gonna get anywhere near as what you're asking for, nor is the University of Minnesota. We have spent ourselves into a deficit in the out biennium. Uh, you're talking about short of $3 billion just for Minsku. What do we do here? Because it's not gonna happen. You're not gonna get anywhere near that. I guess we're gonna continue our dereliction of duty because it's not there. 
and at some point we're going to have to get real here uh, and work with some numbers we can work with to get as much as we can uh, for every dollar spent. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, and to the witness, uh, do you have like a Plan B because Plan A is fantasy land? Vice Chancellor, you'll Mr. Chairman, Representative Davids, indeed, um, I would argue this is a, a state issue. It impacts veterans, the DNR, Health and Human Services, not just <laughs> University of Minnesota and Minnesota State. We are in the process right now of reviewing the space utilization and enrollment trends across of all of our campuses and taking a look at uh, new and more aggressive guidelines from our board of trustees on what goes into our, what are the expectations within our capital investment or our comprehensive facilities plans and where are there opportunities for us to either mothball or uh, lease space to other entities that might find it useful in our collaboration. And uh, you also see in some of our requests, for example, the Cecil project at Winona State University actually reduces square footage, but, it, but again, that would require investment. But we are looking at that uh, when we look at the way we're teaching now versus where we did even 10 years ago, the mix of online, in-person classes, and then the, the space utilization is an important part. Um, and we're, we're gonna have to make some tough decisions and there's no doubt about it. Uh, Representative Davids, uh, Winona think, State University alumni. Uh, <laughs> I only favor funding for Winona State, just so I'm clear on that. Uh, but in all seriousness, uh, you look at the governor's proposal. Do we call that a dereliction of duty? Or do we call it being responsible to what we have? I'm not sure. That should, that's just a question because you go down to the governor's numbers. And, you know, we're listening to all this stuff because we're polite and we're really nice. But at some point, I'd really like to dig into the numbers of what we can do, not just what we want to do. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Cleveland. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And Vice Chancellor, thank you for being here. And thank you for hearing my question over these five years that I've served on this committee. Um, your job is not to tell us which of the projects we fund or not fund. <laughs> Your job is to tell us what state properties we own and what is the condition of that property. And this uh, list that you have provided is informative and instructive. <laughs> so I wanna say thank you for being here and um, just being forthright with us about the situation before us. And then we are able to make the decisions that we need to make based on what we have. And um, I want to thank you also for your dedication to our students. You know, when you, you use the phrase, and, I, and the reason I'm going to repeat it is because as a mediator, when I hear something three times, it tells me that it's really important to the person speaking. And you use the phrase warm, safe, dry. Warm, safe, dry. We live in Minnesota. <laughs> Those are key uh, statements that we need for all of our state buildings. And then the other thing that you said to us, which I thought was really important for us to hear, is the institutions that you are maintaining and keeping up in a professional way to the best of your ability are the door to the future and the opportunities of tomorrow. Also really important things for us to hear. So thank you for reminding us of our obligation to preserve the assets that uh, Minnesotans of the past have built and created and to remind us that we need to keep them in good shape for our students of tomorrow mm -hmm. today and tomorrow mm -hmm. so thank you and I appreciate the work that you do right. vice chancellor I'd like to draw your attention to page four of nine and page five of nine on this handout this is the uh, preliminary campus priority one and then there's a statement at the bottom of page four where you note specific projects and actual costs will depend on funding level and college and university conditions at the time of the appropriation. Yeah. As I said at the last committee meeting, the Capital Investment Committee is seriously considering, particularly in the HEPA requests of both systems, to list by project when we do the capital investment bill. Now this is in alphabetical order, uh, and I just read the notation. So by the time we would get the capital investment bill together, would you be able to tell us what the real priority would be, not in alphabetical order, but by priority order of what you would do so we would have some idea in the capital investment committee, in this committee too, 
what would be the real priority of these projects? Uh, Mr. Chair, indeed, that would be a, a great exercise and where we've provide, provided today is an objective measure based on the individual college university priorities. Now, when it, this turns into an art, when we get to funding less than our number one priorities, and then if, if we've done that in the past with uh, the committees, both of the Senate and the House higher ed committees, uh, correction, the uh, uh, capital investment committees, and we have provided lists uh, at the time of certain funding levels and different scenarios, and that's where we make some decisions on, okay, if I can't fully fund this roof, can I fund the design this year in hopes that we'll get uh, construction funding next year? If we get a, um, an example would be if we get a $20 million heaper list, it's gonna be hard for me to make a, a decision, a recommendation that we fully fund the ice plant that St. Cloud State University and taking over half of the money that's made available. So indeed, uh, we would have a conversation with that should a certain number, certain level of funding be made available. Uh, Vice Chancellor Yolitz, but you would make that decision one way or another. I mean, why can't you make it when we're doing the appropriation? That is the critical question that's being asked here. I know we haven't done this before, mm -hmm. but this is a different uh, funding for all of the systems, uh, both on the capital side and on the uh, operational side. Mm -hmm. and, and I know it as I'm just looking down the list, the roof replacements are significantly littered throughout this list. And then, of course, anything that deals with heating and chilling plants are, again, extremely critical. I, I don't know how critical, but you would. So in capital investment, and this discussion occurred last week twice, mm -hmm. it's going to occur, I think, this week twice. How do we do this by project that best serves you? Because that's coming. Mr. Chair, indeed, uh, this is our priority right now for the $200 million for asset preservation for Minnesota State. Now, should there, uh, the capital investment committee be considering a, a number less than $200 million, we will do a, a, a priority list based on that. And it'll be a function of, um, first of all, campus and, and priority, and then it'll be a function of where is the uh, facility in terms of the potential for failure. And if, if that failure happens, what hap what's the academic impact? If it's an electrical system and the entire campus goes down, that'll get a, a, a nod towards the front of the list. Uh, same thing with a mechanical system that feeds an entire campus versus just a small part of a campus. So that's gonna, Mr. Chair, be a function of the level of funding that's being recommended, and then we'll work our way towards that. It's part of the art, I think, as I tried to describe well, it. Vice Chancellor Yolis, I just want to be clear, not alphabetical order, but order by need. And that's what we're going to need in this committee, and we're going to need it in capital investment. So it, whatever the number is, and we would take a very close look in capital investment and this committee, what that number would be and where we would have to draw the line to fund those needs. <coughs> Representative <coughs> Rare. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You know, I feel like we're kind of bemoaning the fact that we don't have enough funds to cover this. And we literally just came off of last session a historic uh, surplus of $19 billion. Because, of course, at the beginning of session, we did this little um, inflation bill, which took a, supposedly took away. But it really is $19 billion. And out of that $19 billion surplus, we gave Min State $44 million for HEPR. We could have wiped out easily the entire $1.5 billion of HEPR need with $19 billion <coughs> surplus. It, it's heartbreaking to me to see where the priorities lacked. And Min State should have been a higher priority, in my opinion, than a $44 million HEPR allotment out of that $19 billion surplus. Mm -hmm. um, we could have easily wiped away your entire HEPA need for the entire system. Not even blinked an eye. The $1.546 billion could have just been taken care of. We had the money. Um, unfortunately, the legislature didn't have the priority. And that breaks my heart that that wasn't a priority. We could have just wiped this away. And then on top of that, we were just in the prior committee, we were just talking about, or trying to talk about, I should say, Representative Robbins, 
trying to talk about this very building that we're sitting in, that we're going to be spending about $730 million to, to renovate this building and add an addition. And just to put that in perspective, the entire Senate building was only $90 million, and now we're spending $730 million to renovate this building that we're sitting in, that we work in, and expand it. We don't have a problem of a lack of money. We have a problem of a lack of decisions and priorities. I, would, I was really hoping we would prioritize Penn State. You have outstanding needs. They're growing exponentially. As you said, they've doubled since 2013. The heap for needs alone. You have 57 different campuses, I believe. And we could have brought them all up to the highest standard and, and drawn in students. Instead of losing 20% of our high school graduates to other states, we could have kept them and maybe in, and that's the net loss and encouraged more to come in because Men's State should be the shining jewel of this state. We had the money. We had other priorities. I disagree with those priorities. I wish we could have put them here. Even in our budget, we spent $650 million in the last in this biennium and 450 in the next biennium for higher education above base that's a lot of money and still you only got 44.7 million dollars we don't have a lack of money we have a lack of priorities i would like to see men's state prioritized unfortunately that 19 billion dollars is gone uh, we have a small surplus remaining but we have a structural deficit in the tails mm -hmm. So we have spent ourselves into this situation, and we have a lack of priority for Men's State, which absolutely, in my opinion, should be one of our top priorities. So that's where we sit. It's, uh, it's upsetting and, and disheartening to me to see these numbers literally doubling from 2013 in the last decade. So that's where I stand with this, Mr. Chair. Representative McDonald. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, a wise friend of mine said that uh, compared to two, we have too many barns and not enough horses. Uh, thank you, Representative Davids, for your sage advice. My question for you, Vice Chancellor, is um, uh, as far as the wants, it's kind of in the following the same questions as our esteemed chairman of this committee, who I appreciate and admire for his non-dereliction of duty in holding the <coughs> Budgets, what well, the uh, the university and the states by the budgets, right? Um, so the question, as far as the needs and the wants, now I just look at, and uh, maybe uh, the chairman and Representative Davis will close their ears, to pick on the Winona State University, or just a, a question regarding that. Uh, the Center for Interdisciplinary uh, Collaboration and Engagement. Now I know what that kind of degree requires. They ask there are seventy one thousand seven hundred ninety three dollars, um, and there's other asks that require new buildings, more barns for less horses. So out of those requests and asks, is it wise to build new buildings and, not, uh, and defray money away from the buildings that we actually own and need to repair? And should we not, you know what happens to buildings that are falling in disrepair. They have to be demolished. And in this budget here, in this the packet that you've mentioned to bring to us, there's many buildings that need to be demolished to build new ones. Is it wise to do so? And then the second part of that question, as far as the new uh, project for Winona, uh, is there a huge need for that kind of degree, the interdisciplinary uh, collaboration degree? I see the importance. I would be one of those. If I was starting over, I'd see one of those two degrees that don't really quite match, but I can put them together, because it's critical thinking, creative kind of people like myself that would like that degree. But. Uh, so that's the question. Is there a need for that? And then furthermore, the, the uh, building more buildings instead of taking care of what yeah. we have. Vice Chancellor, you all Yeah, Mr. Chair and Representative McDonald, if I could start at the, at, at the strategic level, if fully funded, this capital budget request would actually reduce our academic square footed, footage by about 70,000 square feet. Yeah. So between the, uh, um, the project at MSU Mankato, as well as the Cecil project, we're actually reducing our square footage getting out of older, inefficient facilities into smaller, tighter, more flexible space. So that's our, been our basic design parameters. We've done the same thing at several other institutions. One is at Rochester Community and, uh, Technical College. We reduced square footage there. 
And earlier at Bemidji State University, we replaced a building with a smaller fo uh, square footage with great views of the lake um, and opened up the campus. Um, so that's from a strategic perspective, our board has really been pushing on no net square footage, in fact, reduce and create more flexible space. You're, for example, I think Representative Davids and uh, Chair Pulowski, I know, have wandered the halls many times in the tiered classrooms, and we're, you're not seeing that anymore. We make it flat, cl flat classrooms, mobile furniture, so we can use the space for multiple different venues. For, for the project itself at, uh, um, at Winona State University, the two buildings that we're tearing down, I mean, you're going, you go back in time when you walk in those buildings um, in terms of uh, the way the, the the mechanical systems are operating in, in, the, in the envelope itself and the best the best analysis is to replace those buildings in their entirety with a smaller footprint more efficient space that we can take advantage of the new technologies uh, for energy efficiency uh, also there's plans for uh, geothermal to help make that building a net zero building in terms of energy use so um, kind of a long answer uh, Mr. Chair and Representative uh, McDonald, but indeed we are trying to make things. Our goal is not to have more barns, and we recognize we don't have as many horses as we used to, so uh, we're trying to get ourselves in the right place. So, Representative McDonald, the two buildings that uh, the Vice Chancellor is referring to, the first is Watkins Hall, which was once the uh, art uh, building. My mother went there when she was an art major in the 1940s. It unfortunately now is a sick building. It's sick with a very flat roof that is in poor condition. And with uh, when it was an art building, they did things in there with sculpture, bronze, and all sorts of things that have made it now impossible to rehabilitate. The second one is the Gildemeister Hall, which was the education building with which I spent a great deal of time in as a teacher, and that would have been in the 1970s. And perhaps even Representative Davids did too. That building is again obsolete. Those two buildings would be torn down and the new facility would be put in its place. The programs that are now in those two buildings and other programs on campus would then be in the Cecil building. So when he says you're reducing the square footage, it would be significantly reducing the square footage and um, adding a building that would be workable. I will also say the Cecil building has a pitched roof as a result of several meetings in the president's office when they had a flat roof and they now agree that a pitched roof would be ideal. Representative McDonald. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Vice Chancellor. I see the wisdom, obviously, now, of course, uh, and I understand, uh, you know, at my age, I do understand the uh, net footage and uh, carbon zero and all improvements, uh, indeed. I just want to, lastly, I just want to state what Representative O'Neill said. Um, uh, Rarick, yes, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> that uh, I would agree that uh, in my district, Hearing from a lot of folks in Wright County, they wanted to have their, the, some of the tax dollars back with the $19 billion surplus. They wanted their money back, and the governor said he was going to give $2,000 back, and they didn't. Uh, they, they weren't honest with that, or something happened, whatever. They had other priorities. I think that I would be confident in bringing back to my voters, who support me in my conservative district, that we would certainly be happy to give a good portion of that tax dollars back, but we want to give a billion dollars out of the $19 billion to the Minnesota state so we can take care of our properties. I think they reelect me and not, uh, you know, ostracize me for that mm -hmm. conservative, financial conservative um, opinion. So I think the DFL had their priorities wrong, not the legislature. I don't take blame for that. Uh, not to cast stones at a glass house, but it is what it is. So, but going forward, I think that uh, our, tax, our taxpayers, our constituents would be happy to support uh, keeper and making sure we take care of our properties. Representative North. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Associate Vice Chancellor, for the presentation. I think the Democrats didn't have their priorities wrong. We had our priorities <laughs> right. We invested the resources <coughs> exactly as needed uh, in places where we will see a significant return of our investment. So there's a significant need in our state, and this is one of them. And we cannot let that one go because I think the request, specific request from the main state is state geo bonds, which is $427.6 million on this request. Members, I think we have to be more clear of how we will do that. It's going to take all of us coming together to do that. 
On top of that, Mr. Chair, I see the user fee that we always talk about of $113.8 million. I know last session we talked about removing the user fee. I don't know where we are with that objective so that we can reduce the burden and the cost to the main state compared to other institutions. Uh, Mr. Chair, do you have any direction or do we need to check in with um, the nonpartisan staff? Um, Re Representative Noor, we've been working on that language literally all session to craft language that would not bind a future legislature, which we can't do, but would also then, with the help of both systems, understand that we want to do that. And I think we have language that we can use. I've also been in consultation with Chair Lee, uh, and he agrees. We're working on the Senate side, which, as you always know, is a little more difficult since I think the initial language came from the Senate side, um, there's probably a residual feeling that they might want to keep it. But again, this would also lower tuition, and that's the, the big kick here is to take that burden off. It's going to increase the, the price of the buildings, that's for sure. But again, how many new buildings are you going to have in a situation that they're now in? So I, I think we're close to having the language. We'll see the language in this committee, and we'll also see it in capital investment. So thank you for bringing that up, Representative. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Seeing no more questions, members, if you keep your materials, because we're going to be revisiting this, when we get, and I hope we do get, a list that we could use that would be ranked priority, not by alphabet, but by project need, we'll present that. So I want to thank both systems, particularly the Min State system, and I would encourage members to meet in their offices with the Min State system, particularly by project. And if you have projects in your districts, understand where that project is and what would be the need rank when we, uh, we, when we get it. So with that, thank you very much. The next order of business is House File 4175. 4175 is a bill that comes to us from the Rural Electric Authority, and I want to call up the director of uh, Cooperative Relations, People's Energy Cooperative, and I think we have one other person that's coming up. Members, this simply makes a change, and it adds energy to this program. And I want to have the testifiers. Who would wish to go first? Ms. Stevens, do you wish to? Sure. All right, welcome to the committee, and please identify yourself for the record. Good morning, Mr. Chair um, and the committee members. My name is Gwen Stevens, and I'm the Director of Cooperative Relations at People's Energy Cooperative. We're located just north of Rochester in Orinoco, which is in Representative Hicks District, and we serve all the way south into Chatfield in, Mr. in Representative David's district. I'm here today to ask the committee um, to add energy as an eligible program of study for a workforce development scholarship. As I read each of the nine eligible programs currently listed in statute, I couldn't help but think that electricity is required for all of them to function, as well as the rest of our economy and our lives. Our cooperative is like many electric utilities across, across the country that are experiencing the effects of baby boomers retiring and not enough young qualified people to replace those <coughs> vacant spots. MRE co MREA cooperatives across the state report not getting enough qualified applicants as their biggest hiring challenge. It's next to impossible to hire experienced journey line workers or electrical engineers. As a matter of fact, I was talking with a national recruiter recently who told me it would probably be easier to hire a unicorn than an electrical engineer with power experience. With 25% of Minnesota's current cooperative workforce eligible to retire in the next five years, the workers we need to fill these jobs need to be in training now. In addition to these existing challenges, the increasing electrification of our economy is supercharging the growth of the electrical grid and intensifying the energy sector's workforce needs alongside it. Line workers and engineers are the most talked about jobs in our sector, but there are many other power technology professionals that are also important to ensure safe, reliable, and affordable electricity for our member owners. For example, at our cooperative, field engineers and substation technicians ensure our distribution system is built and operated effectively and efficiently. Electricians, meter technicians, and distributed energy coordinators all support energy efficiency and distributed renewable energy generation programs. 
Beyond cooperatives, there are many other energy sector jobs that are growing as more renewable energy resources are being built and as technology advances, creating new opportunities in building EV charging station, stations, energy storage systems, and more. The significant decrease in qualified applicants at our organization has caused us to get creative with recruitment efforts. We have had a more concerted effort to promote electrical energy professions by introducing young students to electrical sector careers while presenting electrical safety information in 54 elementary classrooms since January 2022. During that same time, we've participated in an average of five career fairs for high school students to promote all career opportunities at the cooperative. We even partnered with our local NBC affiliate, KTTC News, to feature line workers in one of their monthly critical careers segments. In addition to all of our outreach and education work, we fund $30,000 worth of scholarships annually. <clears throat> what we do is award $1,000 scholarships to any accredited program, but then $2,000 scholarships to any student that enrolls in a line worker program. The Workforce Development Scholarship Program was designed to encourage businesses and colleges to work together to create strong workforce pipelines that serve the needs of their community and supercharge student financial aid through laying in additional scholarships from the local businesses. Cooperatives are among the most active organizations in their communities, operate in every corner of the state, and frequently utilize their philanthropic dollars for scholarships. For all these reasons and more, cooperatives, cooperatives are in an ideal partner for fulfilling the promise of this program. The Workforce Development Scholarship would be one more arrow in our quiver to aim students toward a career in the electric energy sector. I hope you'll help our industry in this way. Thank you for your time and consideration, Mr. Chair. Members, I want to thank Representative Davids for uh, coming on as second author of the bill. Uh, I think some of you may remember that in the uh, Winona mini session of October 2019, uh, October 2nd, 3rd and 4th, 2019, one of the major hearings was held at My Energy in Rushford, and they illustrated the fact that this is exactly the type of thing we need to do to create a workforce. The Min State system is also very supportive of this legislation. We're not taking action on it today. This is something that we might include as we move forward putting together our policy bill and or any type of fiscal bill. So thank you, Representative Davids. Representative Davids. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Ms. Stevens, for the testimony. Obviously, a, a critical need here. Um, I'm very supportive of this bill, but I'd also like to just give some kudos to the chairman who has done more, in my opinion, for uh, rural electric cooperatives than anybody I know. So uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for that, and thank you for putting this good bill together. Any questions, members? Seeing no questions, and we have nothing else on the agenda, meeting is adjourned.